I'm Luke Milky, helping you master the art of filmmaking. Today we're talking about... So control stability is one of the keys to having a good production. Every genre has its own style and look and feel. Like you think of an action film, a lot more motion, a lot more movement, but maybe a drama or romance is going to be much more controlled, slower motion, but motion is still there. The motion that you're putting into your camera is going to relate an emotion on the screen, which is going to impact your audience. You want to make sure when you create the motion that you have a controlled motion. You don't want to have it too stable, like on a tripod all the time, kind of like what we're doing right here, because that's going to just look kind of flat. It's not going to have the energy of the movement in the camera. In the older films, there used to be a lot of your static shots because the equipment was so big, it was really hard to get a lot of the motion in there with these 60, 80, 100 pound cameras with all these huge dolly setups. So a lot of times it would just be static shots. But also be careful of not using too much motion or too much jitter into your shots. I think a great example of this would be the Bourne series. They kind of pushed the edge in how much motion there was. I think they might have gone sometimes a little bit too much to make it a little bit uh, difficult to watch, but they were really trying to add that confusion, the energy that the actors were feeling in the scene so that the audience would also relate to what's happening. You want to be careful you don't make it too shaky and too jittery though because you're going to make your audience sick and you really don't want your audience puking while watching your film. Having an audience puking on your screen does not look good on your Rotten Tomato rating. So you want to make sure you plan out your look and feel of your film. There's a couple things you have to look out when you're trying to make the planning. First, what is the style look you want to go with? Don't just show up on set and assume, well, this is the equipment we have, this is what we're going to do. You want to plan that out in advance. Do you want to have the more handheld feel? Are you going to have more stable shots? Are you going to have the smooth motion? Are you going to have to pull out some of the bigger equipment? The other thing you need to think about is, what does my budget actually allow me to do? Yes, there's some equipment that is absolutely incredible. You can do pretty much anything with it. You can run full speed with it and it's going to look perfectly smooth on a three axis gimbal, but you might not be able to afford that. So you also want to look at what can you afford and what are some of these tips and tricks that you can apply to make a cheaper production look like a expensive production. So we're going to show you some tips and tricks to go from free all the way to higher end budgets to make your film look fantastic. So now we're going to talk about tripod shots. But you can also mimic tripod shots if you don't have one by using a table, a shelf, the floor, a pillow, books. You can use a whole variety of different things to mimic a tripod shot that might not be quite as flexible, but you can still do the same basic shot as a tripod look. If you want to see a short film that was shot using only non-traditional tripod shots like books and things like that, check out this video done by Isaiah Kazarovich, who will be joining us later in this video. So the advantage of a tripod is it is the most stable of all shots which is pretty obvious. It has its uses and purposes for interviews like this. Sometimes it's used for over the shoulder shots to get in interviews, things like that. That's what a tripod does best. One of the great ways to make a tripod have a little more motion energy to it is capture something that is moving. That will give the energy of the object into the scene and it feels like your shot is a little bit bigger, more grand type of a shot. So with a tripod, obviously you can tilt and pan like that with your tripod, but how do you do that with non-traditional items if you have a tripod? One thing you can do is add books. You can add pillows that will tilt and angle your camera, which can mimic some of the shots, especially if you're doing the low angle shots that a tripod just can't do by itself. So the biggest con, and I'm not talking about a criminal, of having a tripod shot is the limited amount of motion you can put into it. You're pretty much limited to pans and tilts, which means you're basically stuck in one spot and can't really do a whole lot. Next is freehand. Handheld shots are one of the hardest ones to do properly because it's very easy to make them too jittery, too shaky, and just going to make your audience sick. And once again, we don't want to make our audience sick. So here's some tips and techniques that you can do to make your handheld shots look more professional and not make your audience sick. So one of the things you can do is have a wider lens. The wider your lens, the less you're going to see the jitters because the longer your lens, it magnifies everything, including the jitters and shakes. So a long lens is going to be a much shakier, jittier shot than a wide lens. So oftentimes for handheld shots, I like to use a 35 millimeter or wider to help eliminate some of that jitters in the shot. Another thing you want to work on is controlled breathing. I'm not talking about going all yoga and that, but you want to have controlled rhythmic breathing because if you're panting and breathing hard, that motion is going to get into your video as well, as well as your heart rate is going to be higher. It's going to cause you more unstable. Control your breathing deep in and out breath. Sometimes I'll even hold my breath just to make sure it's extra stable while I'm getting the crucial part of a shot. And most shots aren't really longer than five to eight seconds anyway. 
So hopefully you can hold your breath for five to eight seconds if you need it. Just a random tip. Make sure you have extra bulbs when you're on set because this one died in the middle of our take. So another tip is to use two hands. Some will use just one hand. I don't like doing that for a couple reasons. One, it's gonna be much more tiring. Two, you don't have nearly the same stability. I like to put on at least smaller cameras like this, one hand towards the back, one towards the front, a lot of times on the lens hood. And that gives me three points of contact in my camera to make it more stable. I can control the stability front and back and side to side. So I can be a much smoother shot and controlled stability on my camera. So another great option to help make it more stable is hold the camera close. Some people will hold the camera out like this and you're gonna get a lot more jitters if you're doing that way. I like to lock it in the elbows into the body. This is why breathing is very important. Your torso is much more stable than your arms. So doing this locking into your body really helps make your camera much more stable. So another option if you have a shoulder strap is actually the exactly opposite of what I just said is you put the shoulder strap on, instead of locking into your body, you actually push it out. Use the camera strap and the motion against it as a stabilizer. Don't push too hard because your body can really shake and you could potentially break your strap or just cause a lot of tension in your neck. But having a little bit of tension on there is gonna really help stabilize the shot. It is a little more tiring holding the camera this far out for a long time. So another thing you wanna do is spread your feet out and bend your knees. You wanna flex the knees. This will give you the ability to move side to side, up and down smoothly, and still keep the arms locked into your body. But it'll also keep you from passing out if your knees are locked for too long, because you really don't want to pass out on set, especially if you have an expensive camera. That's going to be a problem. No one will ever let you forget passing out on set. So another thing I like to do is give actually intentional small motion. So I try to hold it really still, muscles are going to be jittery. Muscles that are held still are going to be much shakier than muscles in motion. Muscles in motion are much smoother. So we'll actually add a little bit of motion intentionally. That gives it the energy and feel of handheld, but it's gonna be much smoother than just, you don't wanna look like the scared cameraman, but if you have the little bit of motion, you have a much better shot with controlled motion versus trying to hold it still and getting jittery motion. Another thing you can do is lean against a wall or a pillar, which works great if you're inside a building or near a building. But if you're outside and the elements, you don't have anything to lean against like a tree, another thing you can do is use another person. So you can actually lean against the person like this and get the stability of both of you, which will make your shot much more stable. Or if they're shorter, I used to be a shorter brother, I had this all the time, where my older brother would actually put the camera on top of my head or he would use my shoulders to set his camera on. Isaiah here is a little bit too tall for that or I'm too short, I'm not sure which. But that is also another option to do it that way. So yes, Handheld has its advantages, but there are some of the cons. One is it can still be jittery even with use of some of these techniques, especially if you're like me and you have some blood sugar issues. If I'm not eating constantly on set, which sometimes you're just not able to eat as much as you want, you're gonna start getting a little bit sh more jittery because your blood sugar is down, you're getting a little more shaky. It can be difficult to work with in post if it's not quite right. Yes, you can add motion stabilizers, but motion stabilizers sometimes work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they grab the wrong thing in the shot and they start making it look all wonky. And sometimes the foreground, the backgrounds, if it's too jittery or the wrong motion, the foreground, the backgrounds won't stabilize together and one will actually become worse than the other. So the next one we're gonna talk about is the shoulder mount. There's a ton of different styles for this. This is one that we just got recently. And the advantage is too is when you put it on, you can go forever. Basically, if you're able to still stand, you can pretty much keep on shooting. One of the things that this is really good for is doing like run and gun interview style, if you're doing documentary styles, or if you're doing something like an over the shoulder shot, something like this is used a lot because it's easy. It's right about the right height for over the shoulder for interviews. It's pretty much eye level. It really helps with something like that. Now let's jump into some tips and techniques on how to use this better. So one of the things you can do to make this better, just like doing handheld and a lot of camera motion is you want to move at the waist and the knees. That's really important to go sway there because Obviously, you really can't move it out like this. So move at the waist and the knees. So when you're moving around with these, you wanna make sure you walk with rather bent knees. So you don't wanna just walk straight. That's gonna have a lot of jitter to it. If you flex your knees, you're gonna have natural shock absorbers into your legs. That'll make your shot much smoother. You might be a little bit shorter with it that way. If you haven't worked out your legs a lot before this, you'll probably feel a pretty good burn doing that if you do it for extended periods of times. But it'll make your shot much smoother as you're walking around. So one of the big things with the shoulder mount is don't run because when you're running, you get a lot of bounce to it and your shot is gonna look very, very bouncy, very uncontrolled 
because it's gonna bounce every time your body has impact, the camera's gonna have impact as well. It's gonna make your shot look very, very shaky and very hard motion. So some of the cons with this is it's hard to do a lot of motion with it. You can't really run around with it. Another con is it's difficult to do pedestal shots. You can't go from low to high or high to low very well without just doing a ton of squats. And even then you can't get a lot of motion because you can only go two-ish feet. So another option to talk about is the body pack. This one I haven't seen used a whole lot in the last few years by itself. I've seen it used with like three axis gimbals, but by itself I haven't seen it used a whole lot recently. But this one is good for running around because you can do a lot of running with it. You can go pretty much all day with something like this. As long as it's balanced right, you're not having it hang way out there, that's gonna start stressing the back a little bit. But so let's jump in some tips and techniques on how to use a body pack properly. So one thing you wanna do is make sure you balance the camera out right. This is not technically quite balanced right because if I push it down, it'll bounce back up. So you wanna adjust your camera so it will pretty much float on its own. If you set it at a height, it will sit there. Another thing that's very important when having something like this is it's designed typically to do a lot more motion, a lot more running with it. So when you do this, you wanna have a spotter or sometimes call an assistant to make sure when you're running, you're not gonna run into stuff. Because <laughs> you're paying attention to what's on the camera and not so much if you're running on rough terrain, if you're gonna hit a rock or not. You wanna have your assistant or your spotter help watch those things for you so you don't run into stuff. There are a few cons with using body pack. Not all body packs fit all body styles. Some body styles just don't work with it, so you gotta check and see if it's comfortable for you to use. You wanna look into that first. It can also throw off the balance, especially if you're running and the camera's out too far. It can start making you front heavy and make you lose your balance as well. If you have back problems, this can put some stress in your back, especially if it's not quite balanced right, the camera's out quite a ways from your body. That'll start putting tension in the back and you wanna watch out for that. Hello, I am Isaac Zarvich and I am stealing the show on Fusion Videos. Today, we're talking about the Glidecam HD2000 and some of the pros and cons and how to use the stabilizer. First off, the HD2000 is very versatile. It has a number of functionality. Number one, I can uh, hold it on the gimbal and get very stable and smooth shots if the gimbal is balanced. Second, I can grab the shaft and use it kind of like a shoulder mount if I take it and tuck it into the body. And then I can kind of do it like this. I have found that I can shoot up to 10 hours on a shoot day with just this gimbal and I can mimic tripod shots. I can mimic uh, handheld shots by just holding it right here. I can mimic stable gimbal shots with just one tool. And so I have found it to be very useful. And um, another thing that I found to be very useful about this particular tool is I can mount a quick release plate on here. So all I need to do is take my camera with a quick release plate and slide it right on. Super easy to do. And at this point, I can easily balance my camera onto the glide cam, but also if I need a tripod shot, I can just take the camera off and now I can slide it onto my tripod and very, very easily have a very switchable rig. Very, very switchable. Another thing to know about the glide cam HD 2000 and any kind of stabilizer like this is that it requires lots and lots of practice. My very first few shots on the glide cam were very wobbly, even though it was balanced correctly because it just requires an extreme, unordinary attention to detail. If I, I encourage you, if you get one of these that you practice every day and you practice good, solid glide cam techniques. A few tips that you need to know about using the Glidecam HD2000 is number one, make sure it's balanced properly. A few tips to do that are you can take your lens cap off. Uh, it's very important to achieving correct balance. Another thing to do is make sure your drop time is correct. One of the most, um, one of the most overlooked balancing techniques is to have a three, at least a two to three second drop time. And a lot of times people count incorrectly. So right now my drop time is a little too fast, but if I count, it goes one, two, it's about two seconds. It should be about 2.5 to three seconds. So make sure your glide cam is balanced properly. There are about a billion videos on how to do this on YouTube, so go and check those out. Another tip that you can use is mastering the offhand. One of the things that you need to do is you need to have your offhand come in and point it at things that you want to video. One of the things that people usually do is they hold the glide cam with their right dominant hand 
because it's stronger and it's easier to hold it. What I recommend you do is to hold the, your glide cam with your left non-dominant hand because then you can use your right dominant hand to have more control over um, how you're pointing your, your camera. And the main reason for this is when you're writing with your dominant hand, you can write with more finesse. And it's the same thing with your offhand. The offhand takes more finesse. And so I recommend that you guide your glide cam with your dominant hand and hold your glide cam with your non-dominant hand. Another tip I have for you concerning the glide cam HD2000 is that you learn the walk. A lot of people call this the duck walk, but apparently, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's when you have your knees bent and you have your arms into your chest and you have your glide cam out in front of you and you're kind of just plopping around like a duck. And I've had people who have looked out the window of a building that I was filming and they have said, what in the world is that guy doing? And my wife has had to tell them, oh, he's doing the glide cam walk. And they look at her and they're saying, what in the world is that? And she has to tell them, yeah, it's what you do to get smooth shots. And so yes, people are gonna laugh at you. They're gonna call you crazy. In fact, I was shooting on a dance floor and I was just going around the couple like this, you know, doing my duck walk and people come up to me and they say, what are you even doing out there? You look like a bozo. <laughs> <laughs> they said that and uh, I, t I had to tell them it's part of getting a smooth shots once I delivered the video to the client there was no complaints so master the walk a few cons that I've noticed with the glide cam first off each shot is not perfect there is human imperfection with every shot it is not uh, perfectly controlled if you're using a three-axis gimbal for instance you can mimic the same shot over and over and over whereas with the glide cam uh, the variations of each take is going to be different. Um, and, so, and so because of that, um, if you're shooting real estate or if you're shooting um, a short film or anything like that, this may not be the tool for you. Another con I have for the glide cam is it's very, very heavy. Um, you can, unless you, are, unless you are Rocky or unless you are Arnold Schwarzenegger or unless you are Luke Milky, uh, you can get very, very tired very easily with uh, a glide cam. So I recommend if you're using this to either work out or practice every single day. Another con is that the glide cam gets unbalanced easily. So throughout the day, I'm constantly adjusting my balance, making little tiny tweaks here or there to make sure it's still perfect balance. Next, we're talking about the three axis gimbal. There's a bunch of different brands and types for this, but it's typically one of the most expensive stabilizers you're going to use on set. One of the issues I find with it, it is probably used too much. It's kind of like a drone. Once it came out and hit the populace at a somewhat affordable rate, everybody started using it. I know I had this problem back in one of my first longer short films. I used it for almost every shot. And looking back, I wish I would have used different techniques for different things. But we were running gun. It was the first time I really got to use it. And that I, it can actually be a problem is using it too much. It is by far my favorite piece of equipment. I know I just said it can be overused. And that's part of the reason I think a lot of people overuse it. It's pretty much everybody's favorite type of piece of equipment that uses one of these things. And then they kind of just lean towards their favorites and that's what happens. One of the other advantages to a lot of these type of three axis gimbals, if you have the right camera, you can actually have a second person operating the camera, working all that, while the first person is just moving the axis gimbal around, giving you much more precise shots. So one person focus on getting the image, the other person can focus on moving the camera, put those two together. If you work well as a team, you're gonna have an amazing shot. So let's jump into some tips and techniques on how to make a three axis gimbal work better. So the first tip is hit the gym. And I'm not kidding about this. This thing will punish you if you don't have the full body packs to go along with it, because these things get very, very tiring for long periods of time. You also want to spend the time to make sure you balance your three axis gimbal properly. Every three axis gimbal has their own way of balancing, so you want to make sure you check out how yours works. Make sure you spend the extra time to balance it properly because that will definitely pay off on set. So just like a lot of the other camera techniques, you want to move with the knees and the waist as much as possible. You don't want to be doing too much with the arms because that's going to tire you out much faster. One of the big things you want to also practice your movement before going live. A lot of times these axis gimbals also have controlled counter pan in motion. So you wanna make sure you practice to get that just right before you go live. 
So another thing you want is an auto-focusing lens when you do these three-axis gimbals, especially when you're by yourself and you don't have an assistant that's able to control your focus wirelessly. Another thing you want to have is an external monitor attached to the three-axis gimbal. Yes, you can still see your camera screen, but it's very, very difficult to really see exactly what's happening. A lot of times you're seeing through the axis gimbal or your angle's wrong for that. It'll help it stay in focus, but also frame your image up properly. Once again, you want to support the elbows up against the body when possible. This will use your body stabilization as well as something to rest your arms against instead of having to hold the weight the whole time just in your arms and your shoulders. You can use your torso to hold the weight of the axis gimbal. And rest every time you have the chance. These things will get really tiring, especially if you're doing a 10, 12, 16 hour shoot. Put the camera off the side every chance you have. So some of the cons are it's very heavy without support. It can really get tiring if you don't have something holding the weight, if you have to hold it all yourself. It can be very difficult to operate with one person because you can't control your focus, your zooms, anything like that. And you just lose a lot of the control that you would have if you can actually access your camera. It can be very difficult to focus because as soon as you try touching the camera, if you don't have a wireless focus on it, it's gonna cause the whole thing to jitter and not really help your shot. If you wanna change lenses, it's very, very difficult because you have to rebalance everything. Because every lens is weighted differently, it throws the balance of your gimbal off. To balance it right, it can be very time consuming as well. So if you wanna see a comparison between a three axis gimbal and a glide cam, which are two of the most popular stabilizers in the market right now, check out our other video that'll be coming soon. To make a tripod look like it has motion, motion, <laughs> more grand, more grander. Mm -hmm. From multiple points, I have three. Oh, hello. The light went out. This thing will punish you. If you found this video helpful, please let us know in the comments below or like it, share it, subscribe, and let us know if there's any other topics you would like us to cover in the future.